And so I'm going to um, say a few words about sound as a material, how I think about it as an artist. Uh, but first I'll say something about that uh, piece we just saw. Um, originally the video and the sound to that piece uh, were not intended to go together. The, the video was from a piece in 2004 called Vortex, and I'll speak about it in a bit. And the sound, um, I wanted something recent, and it was just the most recent thing that I, that I did performatively before I came to Sasfe. It was a few minutes from a 30-minute improvisation that happened in a concert in Vienna um, a day or two before we came to Sasfe. Um, the video, I think, shows how I like to work with images. Um, I'm firstly a composer, and my approach to images is, is, a, is a synesthetic or visual music-oriented uh, one. Uh, so for me, the, the visuals are usually, even when they have some level of representation, uh, an extension of musical qualities. Um, so even though these pieces didn't, uh, weren't intended to go together, they shared a mood, and, um, and I thought that they worked together nicely. It ended up being fortuitous um, that I chose to do this, uh, to show this video. I think I chose it while still in Vienna. Because um, in the several sessions here, there's been a discussion of the difference uh, between notions of time that are uh, in extension or striated and notes, notions of time that are, are floating or um, non-extensive. And the, this video, although um, abstract, uh, conceptually, this is the subject matter of this video. Um, we have on one level um, this extension from, from a, uh, a, a uh, dimensionless present into both the past and to the future. And then sort of transversal to this, we have this more organic shape that for me represents a kind of floating uh, temporal experience. And they come in and out of focus, and I think this is our experience of time in life. Or at least this is what I was thinking when I made this video in 2004, or as I remember it um, now. So the, um, I'm going to read one page from this paper that I was going to present and show a couple uh, illustrations that go along with it. So is the video still on? A sonic ontology of vibratory materialism treats the human sensorium as a syn synesthetic unity and inherently undermines the efficacy of hermeneutic approaches to sound as text. Affect precedes any representational strategy when thought from a vibrational ontology cuts across mind and body, organic and inorganic, so-called natural and technological. To hear a sound is always to hear a sonic field a singular sound only has an identity at a particular scale of investigation. Every sonic event is a trace of a material process embedded in an already ongoing acoustic situation. What we have here is this is simply light being reflected on a surface of water um, contained in a circular vessel and being uh, vibrated um, by an oscillation. And so the patterning is the patterning that comes from the, the intersection of the water and the sound. In our normal sonic experience, every sound is a complex mix of sonic productions from material processes interpenetrated with reflections from the surrounding space and local objects. And this is, a, is in microcosm, an example of, in a way, our normal experience of, of hearing. Um, we're not usually in circular spaces and we're not usually listening to sine waves or square waves, but a similar phenomenon is always happening. This video I find quite remarkable. What's happening here is water's coming through a hose. The hose is attached to a speaker. The speaker is playing a 24 cycle square wave. And we get the shape. The water's still flowing, right? It hasn't stopped. This is a persistence. Here you see turning up the amplitude. There's the shape. Right? Now it's quite beautiful and mysterious to look at on a certain level, I mean, especially when you see these sort of floating nobules of water and realize that that's not water suspended by some trick. trick. That is water flowing through a persistent shape. But the shape is being given to the water by the simple vibration attached to the hose. 
Look at those pieces just floating there. The rhythmic application of energy is an engine of stratification. Like objects are affected in like ways. Every patterned application of energy or wave is a sorting mechanism. But like objects are also often like because they share related morphogenetic histories and these histories themselves are relationships between materials and patterned applications of energy. The, patterned, the patterning of the application of energy does not have to be in any way transcendent to the material being structured. The resistance to being moved is enough to pattern the energetic movement. Structure can be seen as an imminent resonant situation. The situation persists as long as the energetic rhythm that shapes it. And just to sum up this little one page of my paper, <laughs> which I'm not giving, an ontology of vibrational force would examine the ways in which patterned movement generates and maintains structure over time and would be, would be skeptical of conceptions of objecthood that separate material situations from their temporal unfoldings. So now, especially as uh, we've come to the, almost the end of the EGS session, um, for the rest of the time, I just share work, if it's okay. <laughs> so the first thing I'm going to share um, is a piece. It was actually my very first video piece. Around 2000, um, computers, con consumer computers got fast enough to be able to begin to work in real time with video. I was not interested in um, video cinematically or anything like this, but I was interested in, in again, as, as an extension of music, trying to create some kind of synesthetic relation. Uh, at this time, um, when you could first start to work with video uh, in real time, I was able to create structures where I could link the amplitude of the sound uh, vibrationally to processes happening in the video. And this gave me kind of an effect that I wanted to see, or that I found very pleasing. Um, I'll just start this up and explain a little more, and then I'm going to show the whole thing. And it's going to be it's going to be the longest sample I think of the evening. It's ten minutes long, but I think if you just um, relax into it, uh, you'll survive. <laughs> it's it is a, a process-oriented work, so there's an exact process that happens from beginning to end. That, um, so there's no other compositional choices. I made a decision and it runs out. Um, in the visuals, there's, there's some choices that uh, escape from that. But um, sonically, that's completely, it's completely process-oriented work. So I'm going to just get it started for some uh, To get to a right image where I can, OK. Because I just want to explain scale, because this is important. Um, this was a, th a, a work for theater and was with dance. So this was behind a dancer, but the dancer remained immobile to maintain a, a, an exact precision with the symmetry of the video. So this would have been on the floor, and the dancer's head would be right here. So maybe that gives a sense of the, the scale that it should be shown at, or in a performance situation would have to be shown at. Right? And I won't say anything about what the process is, maybe someone, because maybe someone will recognize. Or, or notice or deduce or whatever. But um, I will ask that all the lights go out and that you just kind of zone out for about 10 minutes. <laughs>
So, so if that was trying for you, thanks for your patience. <laughs> but um, like I said, that was my first video piece. Um, I wasn't intending to become, um, to work with video on a regular basis. This was just something, it was sort of a, an experimental idea. I'm struck watching it right now how much it shares the same structure as the first um, video I showed. The way the, the relationship between the sound and the image worked, um, you know, in remix culture likes to make a lot of making new from, from, uh, from appropriation. The entirety of that sound score is made from one, about one second sample um, from the Teletubbies. So it's, it's time for Teletubbies. It's just the, it's time. So um, this is another piece that, that is about time. And um, the, the structure was the it's time sample played as a loop uh, separately in, two, in the two channels. In one channel, starting at two octaves below its normal pitch and over the 10 minutes going up to two octaves above. And in the other channel, starting two octaves above and going to two octaves below. So it's completely processed on the level. The image in the middle, and I hadn't really thought about this when I showed it earlier in class, is being driven by the amplitude of the sound, but it's being driven by the amplitude of both of them. So it's, again, this point of symmetry between the two and the sort of transcoding of the symmetries of the audio to the visual. Um, when a dancer is in front of it, and it's at the proper scale, this is much too small for, um, for the scale it really needs to be seen, and the dancer is oriented so their, their head is in this exact point of, of, the, of the symmetry. This remarkable thing happens where the dancer frequently just disappears, you know, as it, particularly when it goes from a very bright saturated color to black and then back again. Anyway, so that's that. Um, that I think was one of the first pieces that Megan and I collaborated with, or at least it was very early in our collaboration. And as Professor Schmidt I mentioned now we have a space in Philadelphia, which is kind of a, a research laboratory for new forms of experimental interdisciplinary art, is what we call it. But it's also just kind of an old school factory loft live work situation, like, um, like Manhattan probably last saw in the 1950s, I would imagine. But that in, in Philadelphia you can still, still find. It was a 19th century factory, and we have uh, the fourth floor, and we have a public area, and then we've um, there's living space behind. But I wanted to give a sense of what the, what the public area is like and, and the kind of things that go on there. Um, I'm going to show uh, a clip that some nice documentation of an event that doesn't necessarily reflect our usual events there, but it's just nice documentation. It's actually a little more mainstream as an event, so I think um, you should enjoy it. And I'll just play it until it seems like we've had it, um, like it's been going too much.
So that gives you a sense of the space that we, that we live and work in, and um, the kind of things, some, some of the kind of things that go on there. If you saw the door off the side of the stage, that was uh, Tristan and Freya's bedroom. Mm -hmm. So it's very kind of an intimate relationship of, um, of living to artistic practice of different kinds. So um, you, one of the ways that Megan and I work in the space, um, since it is our workspace, is we developed a, a series called the Process Project. And basically what happens is um, once or twice a year, if we can do it, we, um, this is on Vimeo, isn't it? It's going to be. Um, we start the week not, uh, having not spoken to each other about what we're interested in working on. And then um, uh, before an invited audience, uh, without any discussion, to start working improvisationally with whatever materials uh, we have at hand. And out of this has come, has come uh, a number of pieces, although it's not its intention. We don't start the week thinking that we're going to accumulate uh, process, uh, product um, to make a finished piece. We're just interested in exploring our materials together in the same space and in front of an audience. We, uh, we say hello to people, um, perform, for about 30 minutes, and then usually talk for at least twice the length that we performed with the people who were there about what their experience was. And then we do, so we do this about nine times in a week, and we try to do that twice a year. I'm just gonna show um, a very short uh, reel of some excerpts from this year's process project from May. It's really only like a minute and a half long, I think. At the very end, um, there's something I want you to see one thing that I was exploring in this, um, this May's process project was using infrared sensors to track Megan's body as a skeleton. And so I can uh, locate on the computer 21 points on her body in uh, XYZ space, and then I can map those to any um, audio or video parameter. So you'll see only a very tiny bit of that at the end of this video. Uh, but other than that, you'll get a sense of this year's process project and how we work together in the space. clip I would like to show, and so it's a different kind of use of the space. This was a full-length um, piece that we did that's sort of about the space, because it's a site-specific work that used the, the public space in its entirety, with the audience centered in the middle and all the performance around the audience. And also there was, although you can't see it so much in this trailer, there was video um, surrounding at least three quarters of the space using six video projectors and tile it nicely so that the image could continue around. So I'm just going to play this, and then hopefully people will have questions, because I would very much like to hear from questions.
Thank you. Thank you.